And we now want to turn our lens and take a look at leadership because all of these are outstanding ideas, but as we heard from Michael Porter earlier, there to take that next step, there really needs to be a way to make that call to action to make things work even better. And so if you've been previously to our summits that you know that each year we have a panel and we focus on a conversation, our panelists today are Anne Sherry, who is here in the middle, AO, Chair of Carnival Australia, Luke Sayers, AM, CEO of PwC Australia and Vice Chair of PwC Asia PAC, and Daniel Epstein, Founder and CEO of Unreasonable Group. I'm going to give their bios in a moment, but could we just have a round of applause, please, for our three <laughs> CEOs. And, um, Luke, I'm going to start a little bit with you. I'm going to kind of fold your bio into some of the questions. So you're the CEO of PwC. You provide leadership to a team of more than 700 partners and 8,000 staff who partner with global Asian and Australian businesses, and you help them grow to succeed. Uh, PwC is focused on delivering value to clients, and you, you also have a long-term commitment to some community organizations. You're on the board of the Carlton Football Club. You chair... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I briefly got That's into my real sports. Right. <laughs> You're the chair of the Melbourne chapter of the Australian Business and Community Network, and also Emotion 21. And uh, I wanted to start just, if I could, on Emotion 21. Tell us about that. For anybody who doesn't know, you should. Thanks. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Um, that's all about my wife, to be honest. Um, <laughs> My, my wife founded an organisation uh, 10 years ago, um, providing uh, health and wellbeing and dance and fitness for um, kids and young adults that were born with Down syndrome. And uh, I've got four girls, uh, 18, 16, 15 and 14. So now you're supposed to go, oh my gosh, <laughs> 18, 16, 15 and 14. And our 16 year old was, was born with Down syndrome. And we found uh, when Ali was at about the age of five that um, it was getting harder and harder to provide equal opportunities for her. And she loved, she loved dance and loved dance and fitness. So my wife basically said, well, we're just going to start it and we're going to build it and we're going to provide a service to, uh, uh, to individuals and to families that have um, children with Down syndrome to give them equal opportunity. And so she launched this. Uh, to be honest, I came on board for the ride. Um, and 10 years later, we're providing dance uh, services to, to about 250 to 300 people across the country, uh, 10 plus different sites across Victoria. And just recently, with some great funding from Josh Frydenberg and the federal government, um, we've basically piloting um, a university bridging course for people with uh, with Down syndrome, and so we're we're working with a number of employers um, from a sort of a reverse engineering perspective, whereby the employers design the curriculum um, with academics, and then there's a three-year university degree, if you will, um, with work experience every six months, whereby those individuals get to get placements at those those employers, and then at the end of it, they've got a they've got a guaranteed employment opportunity. And so it's it's the first in the world where it's been reverse engineered by business to provide these sorts of opportunities. And, um, you know, why shouldn't they go to university? Why shouldn't they have equal opportunities to get meaningful work? And all of that leads to, to greater fulfillment and uh, and a greater, more fulsome life. So long-winded way of saying, my, my wife's a rock star. <laughs> Well, I love that story, but I also wanted you to speak to it because I think really what we're talking about is that there's not really this um, binary situation, is there anymore, between mm. business on the one hand and what you're doing to do good in the world. You really see it as all part of one thing. One more question on that, and then I'm coming to you, Anne. You wound up in the pages of the AFR because of your stand on diversity and because of kind of taking a lead, kind of sticking your head above the parapet. Can you tell about what happened with the AFR article um, and, and what well, you wrote about? I'm not, I'm not sure which one you're referring to, Anne. <laughs> the one, uh, the snowflake article. Oh, okay. Yeah, where you said you'd been called a snowflake. Yeah, so uh, 
I've been called lots of things, um, <laughs> but my my simple perspective on 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 leadership is that, um, and it is linked to purpose. You have to you have to stand for things, and you have to stand for things that that are meaningful and purposeful and and right and. Um, if other people are standing for other things, for whatever motives, or if it's just a pure difference, that's 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 fine. But leaders leaders need to need to stand up. And there's too much kind of me too um, and followship of things that are maybe um, wrong for society or wrong for uh, wrong for people, and it becomes arguably too political. And so. Um, I had a point of view on, on plebiscites and, and gay marriage. I had a point of view on Indigenous incarceration. I had a point of view on a whole number of societal issues that um, leaders in Australia should have a voice on uh, because the only way the country moves in a progressive way is if leaders have a voice and leaders push and prod the system to change the system for the betterment of the communities that, that, that make up Australia. And so... Um, we just need more leadership. And that brings me to the second leader whom we have on our panel today, and this is Anne Sherry. And we talked briefly about her, but let me tell you a little bit more about Anne before we ask her the same question. Anne is one of Australia's leading business executives with a career that spans government, banking, and cruise tourism. Anne is the chair of UNICEF Australia, and she currently holds non-executive roles with National Australia Bank, Sydney Airport, Palladium Group, Infrastructure Victoria, Rugby Australia, Cape York Partnerships, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Australia. She's an advisor and chairman of Carnival Australia, the largest cruise ship operator in Australia, in Australasia actually, and a division of Carnival Corporation, and has overseen a, really a remarkable growth, a, an unprecedented growth with that cruise line, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. But she began working life as a radiographer and became the first Assistant Secretary of the Office of the Status of Women in Canberra before moving to the banking sector and various other roles there. The Australian government awarded Anne the Centenary Medal in 2001, and in 2004, an Order of Australia, and this is important, 2015, the overall winner of the Australian Financial Review 100 Women of Influence Award. So congratulations, Anne, on that story. And now that we've given you that wonderful <laughs> career, you, do, you are a little bit in the hot seat because you do have a big job. You are leading the search for the new CEO of NAB. So given what has happened, the Royal Commission into banking, nobody went unscathed. But NAB was definitely front and center. What does leadership mean when you're coming back from something like that and you're setting the course, to use a cruise term, for the future? <laughs> uh, well, in some ways it means the same as it always meant. Um, it, just, uh, it just, I guess, has a sharper focus at the moment. Uh, it means we're, you know, we're looking for a leader who um, understands and can help us drive uh, the stakeholder management who understands how you balance the needs of your investors. And Michael Porter was interesting talking about the need to keep educating investors, but to manage the needs and demands of your investors, your customers, your broader stakeholder group. And sometimes that's not easy. Uh, and in fact, often it's not easy. Um, who can uh, engage hearts and minds internally and hearts and minds externally and sometimes that's a different dynamic as well. But ultimately, uh, I mean, we're on a path to rebuild trust and reputation. So we need someone who actually leads that mission. We talked in a conversation beforehand about how shared value to really work well, and Michael Porter talked about yeah. this. It really has to be across the board. It can't just be here and there, even in really excellent examples. There needs to be flow through throughout the organization. Do you think, is that one element of your search? Is that part of the criteria you're using as you search for a new CEO? Um, yeah, uh, look, uh, and you know that I believe shared value isn't something you do on the side. Actually, it's, uh, 
it's something that should be called a strategy. And business strategy in, the, in a contemporary environment, particularly in a banking environment at the moment, needs to have as a core objective the creation of value for more than one stakeholder group. It's got to be about creation of value for others and the sharing of the value that's created. So, um, the, uh, I mean, the Royal Commission highlighted issues around customers not feeling as though they had got the value we'd promised them. And that arguably is, is shared value. You know, those dynamics uh, that we're working on at the moment, and as I mentioned to you, I'm chairing the new customer committee that we've created at the board to start to oversight the creation of products, the delivery of products, the way customers are treated inside the organisation, to give that a different lens and a, to shine a, a sharper light on it, uh, because that's an area that you know we've been found, or the Commission accused us of not paying enough attention to. So uh, at, across the board, though, shared value ultimately has got to be strategy. Mm. It's got to be core to your business strategy, core to your growth strategy, core to everything you do, because if you sit it on the side, and you have a shared value team, apologies to everyone who, whose job says something like that, but you know, shared value team that's responsible for, for doing it, it's got to be built into the business. And uh, unless that happens, I think it will not be um, set front and centre of everything you're doing in your business. Are you close on, on the search? Are you close to yeah, finding the new? Any, any headlines? As this every just journalist, in? no, there's no headlines, so. <laughs> <laughs> we are ask. working diligently and it will happen when it happens. All right, yes. okay. Well, put. well I've, I've got another question know. and then I'm going to come to you, Daniel. I haven't no. forgotten you, but I don't want to leave without touching on your experience with the cruise industry. Yeah. Are you using some of the strategies mm -hmm. that you used so successfully? to turn that around, literally and figuratively, as you undertake this search? How is that affecting your... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, as you know, the, the growth in cruise really was because we said, we want people to want us to come. And that's the only way we could have grown the business the way we have. So small Pacific countries, small villages sometimes, in sm even smaller Pacific countries or uh, islands, we had to, they had to feel as though there was something in it for them, for them to let us in. So you can't just turn up anywhere in the world in a ship and drop anchor and throw a lot of people on a beach. You've actually got to have communities feeling as though there's value in it for them. And, and it was fundamental to our strategy. So give an example of how you did that, because you were saying there were some very specific in wa ways in which you brought value to those communities. Yeah. Well, communities, each community wanted something different, but, you know, an, a remote island in Vanuatu, we'd, you know, we'd scout these places and find that it was deep enough for the ships to get in and blah, blah, blah. Then we'd go and talk to the communities and say, what, if we came, what is it that would be uh, that you would want. And of course, what they wanted were pretty basic things. They said, we've got no jobs. All of our adult population have left. So there's only the old and the young because everybody else has to leave to get work to New Zealand, to Australia, to the cities uh, in the region. Uh, we'd like them still to be living in our community and they'd like to live here. How about jobs? Um, uh, we'd look at their health facilities and you know they'd have uh, metal beds with no mattresses on them. I'd say, well, what happens there? And they say, well, that's where we have our babies. And so we've got no health facilities and the cupboards were bare, there was nothing. And uh, we have no schools. You know, our kids, we do the best we can. And in fact, in one of the islands we went to, even where there was a school, I had like a 1967 Encyclopedia Britannica <laughs> that someone had obviously shipped to them uh, from you know a household like mine when I was 10. Uh, over to uh, Vanuatu, and that was their reference book for their and, kids. And how has that changed now, both in terms of the uh, growth yeah. of the company and in terms of the services, yeah. infrastructure, and products that are available and jobs that are available in these Well, the countries. outcome of all of that strategy is double-digit growth for 12 years, every year for 12 years, uh, um, which is unprecedented. Uh, second thing is that the communities we go to, we hear what they want and we deliver it, so, and that's partly funded, in fact, by passengers. So we add a dollar onto everyone's bill, uh, and then we match it, and so we put healthcare facilities and education facilities everywhere we stop, so the communities have what we would consider pretty basic services. Uh, and also in those communities, we help them build jobs and businesses. So it partly goes to your world as well, which, uh, you know, you can't 
You can't just drop stuff into communities. You've got to help them build from very often very small businesses, like uh, each household could invite someone and cook them lunch and they'll pay for it. Mm. I mean, you know, tiny businesses, which is how business in all of our communities start. And so help them build those sort of businesses that get bigger and bigger to the point at which one of our destinations, which is in Vanuatu, called Mystery Island, uh, on average, everyone who stops there, and they get now about 600,000 people a year, spends $150 Australian every time they stop. Now, that's a community that had no currency, no need for currency, and bought fuel by having it thrown off the side of a barge in the middle of the ocean and float to shore as their mechanism to get fuel. They've got solar power, they've got a school, they've got a health centre. They've got stuff that they couldn't have dreamed of a decade ago. And that's because we've worked with them. And now we've capped the number of people who can go as well, because they've said, enough, that's enough, we can't do any more people. So we said, that's fine, that's capped. And uh, so those communities ha have really fundamentally reshaped themselves off the back of the benefit they said they wanted from us, and we've worked with them to deliver it. So you've also got to do what you promise. You can't turn up and say, we'll come, yeah, we'll do all that stuff next year, year after, year after. Yeah. You've, got uh, to you've actually got to deliver it, yeah. So that takes me to you, Daniel, because this is an example, what is being done with this corporation is an example of the sort of thing you're trying to do in backing entrepreneurs. For those, how many of you were able, were lucky enough to get to hear Daniel at breakfast? Show of hands. Oh, yes. Too many to give water bottles to, but congratulations. Well done, all of you. For the rest of you, if I can just tell you a little bit about Daniel Epstein. Daniel's life has been shaped by a fundamental belief that entrepreneurship is the answer to pretty much everything, all the issues we face today. By the time he received his undergraduate degree in philosophy, he'd already started three companies, and then that just kind of exploded. In 2019, he was recognized by Forbes as one of the world's 50 greatest leaders, Inc. Magazine named him as 30 under 30 entrepreneur and one of the 30 most impactful entrepreneurs. And in 2013, he received the prestigious Entrepreneur of the World Award, along with somebody you might have heard of, Richard Branson, and the president of Liberia at the Global Entrepreneurship Forum. So this is a man who knows a whole lot about being an entrepreneur, but it's actually changed a little bit. Because today what Daniel is attempting to do, and is doing indeed, is he's the founder and CEO of Unreasonable. Unreasonable is dedicated to supporting entrepreneurs to bend history in the right direction. And I'm actually gonna stop there because I could say more, but I'd like for you to. I mean, really, we've already said this. You think that entrepreneurs can pretty much fix everything. Is that right? Any problem that's too, too tough in the too hard basket? Is there a too hard basket for an entrepreneur? Um. Yeah, there, pro there, there probably is. I'm sure there is. I, um, we haven't come across a societal issue um, where market forces couldn't be leveraged to at least contribute uh, to solving the problem. And, and I think that that's, that's because entrepreneurs just have a different perspective on the world, right? Uh, where most of us accept the status quo, um, they refuse to. Uh, and where most of us see market failures, they see market opportunities. Um, I have a friend uh, who I was talking to recently, and I'm... Um, he said it really well when he said, look, there's no shortage of brilliant ideas in the world. We all have them, or we all think we have them. I had, there's no dearth of capital. There's an unbelievable amount of financing on the sidelines right now. What there is a dearth of is courage. Um, there are very few individuals who will risk everything, and I mean everything when I say everything, to ensure that they solve a problem, uh, and those are entrepreneurs. Um, and so, um, yes, I'm sure there are societal issues. I, um, where entrepreneurs um, maybe aren't well positioned, so on, but we, we literally we work with entrepreneurs working on prevention of honor killing in Pakistan to reintegration of former child soldiers in Liberia uh, to you know profitably sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere and yeah, it's talk everything. Yeah, about that one for an example yeah. because there's a very green issue: carbon yeah. in the atmosphere. You've got people who want to put it in the ground yeah. and also want to run uh, run planes on it. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about yeah, some of what you're it, supporting? They want to put it in your shoes. In your, yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, carbon recycling. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit more this afternoon because it's a great example that I think we can relate to. Um, there's a company called Lanzatech, I, and uh, the entrepreneur, her name is Jennifer Holgram. I, she had actually retired I, and then um, got a call from a scientist in New Zealand. I, and she was a biochemist, an executive. Mm -hmm. I'm, 
And uh, she was done working, right? At this point in life, her husband moved to Colorado, um, where, where we're based out of. And uh, she got a call and she couldn't turn her back on the technology when she realized it was real. Uh, in essence, um, this business, Lanza Tech, they can ferment, ferment uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide uh, at the source uh, and uh, turn it into ethanol. Uh, so when we think about beer, which I think we all you know, understand. Uh, Probably one or two people in this yeah, room. Yeah, we, we all get beer. I hear the beer is good in Australia. This is actually my second day in Australia. I still haven't had any beer, uh, which we, we need to change that. tonight. We can rectify Which we need to change. I, but in essence, fermentation process for beer, you take uh, yeast, bacteria, water, sugar, make beer. I mean, she, uh, the inputs for her are carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Uh, water and bioengineered bacteria or microbes, they can eat the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, convert into ethanol. Now, ethanol can easily be changed into jet fuel, um, as well as polyethylene, which is plastic. Uh, so she's partnered with a number of brands. I can't say the, the brands on the apparel side or the furniture side, but soon you'll be able to buy furniture, buy polyester clothing out of plastic or, uh, that is made from carbon dioxide mm -hmm. directly. Uh, it's captured at the steel mill. So instead of going to the atmosphere, it goes into your clothing. I, but they also partnered with Boeing and with Virgin Atlantic. I, Virgin Atlantic, this past fall, flew the first ever commercial airliner powered on jet fuel made out of pollution. I, it's real. It's not science fiction. It sounds like science fiction, but it's nonfiction. It does sound like science fiction. Yeah, and and yeah. that's actually, that raises a point, because when something sounds like science fiction, it can be difficult to get capital to Absolutely. follow that idea. Yeah. Is that the leadership piece Massively. that you have to get people convinced to with this good idea, and you've got to be able to back yeah, that's, I mean, that's the courage piece, right? Mm -hmm. I, in, in terms of where, where I look at entrepreneurs, because they're risking not just capital, but reputation, sleep, relationships, I mean, everything into trying to will something into existence that, that sounds impossible, and it is, it is hard, right? I think entrepreneurs, we, we often overestimate what's achievable in one year, um, all the time, but we underestimate what's achievable in a decade, yeah. right, in 10 years, and so it takes, I think the, the entrepreneurs that you know, I'm humbled to, to work with and, and support at Unreasonable, I, it just takes time, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're in it, I, they see profit as a tool. Their, their motivation is not to, to uh, be profiteers though in that sense, right? All they wanna do is solve the problem and when you're so hell-bent and so determined on solving a problem, I, you could put in the long, long hours, but, but it's decades. But when you talk, and then I want to go back to, to you, Luke, but when you talk about the theme of this conference, which is business on purpose, mm. how crucial is purpose to these ventures that you support at Unreasonable? Yeah, it's everything. I, Why? So, Why is that everything? So, so it, this is actually what got me into the space, was actually just journaling one night. I'm, I, was, I was not the space, to, to be an entrepreneur. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I'm 18 years old, going to uni. It's really awkward. Everybody asks you, you know, what do you want to be? I say, I want to be an entrepreneur. They say, what's your idea? And I didn't have any. I, <laughs> so not, I was a wannabe. I, and, and I was journaling one night I, you know, towards the end of my first semester. And I was writing all these ideas for companies I could start. Was it going to be e-commerce, brick and mortar, social media? What was it going to be? And nothing was resonating. And then I decided to put on like an 18-year-old philosopher hat. I said, well, what is entrepreneuring? I realized, what is business? What do all businesses and all entrepreneurs have in common? And on the first line, I said, all entrepreneurs design solutions to problem sets. I wrote on the second line, well, I can choose the nature of the problems that I want to solve. I wrote on the third line, I'm only going to work on problem sets worthy of my life's work. Um, I think that I, all businesses design solutions to problems. We can choose which problems we want to solve. And that's where the purpose intersects. And I, and I think if we go after the tougher problems, two things happen. One, the motivation factor goes through the roof right, for the teams and the communities that we work with. Um, but two, if you solve harder problems, you create more value. And I think financially, you get rewarded with that uh, if you think into the long term. Well, let me go to you, Luke, on that. Do you think that's key? In other words, is the goal actually, I mean, because a lot of times I think we look away from the difficult problem and put it, I mean, that's a very Australian term. It's in the too hard basket. Yeah. But is really the goal to take the too hard basket and go, wait a minute, this yeah. is the filled with opportunity basket. So just to just to sort of create a bit of um, sparring up here. Yeah, that's first. right. Let's because do it. I think panels become interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. when we maybe agree and disagree. For me, I, I do have the good fortune of working with some fantastic entrepreneurs that are about purpose and profit and finding a right balance and solving a big societal yeah. issue and therefore will result in financial benefit. I also have the, the fortune of working with a lot of entrepreneurs that their, their motive is, is all about profit. profit. Yeah. Um, and to just keep on that continuum, I also have the great joy of working with lots of listed 
CEOs and boards whereby they um, are motivated by purpose and profit and also have the great fortune of working with a, a number of listeds that are just all about profit. profit yep. And so I would hate anybody in the audience thinking that the answer here is, is, is all tied up in, in sort of entrepreneurs. Um, not, that it, not that it is, it isn't. My, my perspective is it's, it's people. And I know that point but, came through. No, no, but fair enough, it's, Luke, but... it's people. Yeah. It's people. It's leaders. Mm. It's leaders that want to make a difference and want to change the status quo yeah. and want to have an impact. And as a result of that, wonderful things will happen to communities, customers, society, and their their businesses. So you think it's totally enough? Good. In other words, are you saying you think it's enough? just to actually try and shake it up, try and you know move quickly and break things. That's enough? Well, and then the shared value follows? Or does shared value need to be part of that? I mean, you're saying that you support, unreasonable is supporting things where that's really intrinsically part of the mission. Yeah, well, you're saying kind of doesn't matter. I'm just you know excited by stuff that's new and yeah, going to fix I the think problem. I, I just don't like um, putting boxes around things, mm. right? And I guess what I'm saying is that... Um, Great people and great organisations, whether big, small, startup, um, um, incumbent, all of those organisations are innovating in different ways. And all let me, them, and I can give you a specific yeah. example around that. So, in two thousand and three, actually, NAB started funding renewable energy, and that was about risk. So, some of what yeah. Daniel's talking about is about the preparedness to take risk. So, it's now twenty nineteen, sixteen years later. We're the number two funder globally yep. of renewables. Globally? 6%. Amazing. Yeah, we've got 6% of the market globally. And so that was about taking risk at a point in time, seeing a future that others were still, you know, 2003. Yeah. I mean, there was a couple of solar panels on a couple of hippies' houses with sort of renewables in 2003. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And porpoises. Yeah. And porpoises, yeah. yeah. So, it, no, I mean, that dynamic to take that position, and I had nothing to do with NAB at the time, but, you know, to take that position then was about risk. And reading what was happening, thinking about how the world could be different and was perhaps going, which entrepreneurs then, you know, there's lots of entrepreneurs who pick that up, but lots of big companies are running with that as yeah, well totally. in ways that we don't talk about in quite the same language. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, but yeah, and, go ahead. Go which ahead. is your point yeah, as well. That's, that's, yeah, that's the point, Anne. And, yeah. and to the second part of your question, there may be organisations that sit there and go, our strategy is kind of shared value. But from my experience, um, and I do agree with Anne, that, that you know those organisations that um, have core to their strategy, core to their strategy, not out to the side, kind of this this blend or this balance of um, profit and purpose, and they're looking at it through a lens of what is sustainably right for the broader community and themselves. I, I think that's more the lens. And I, I'll give you an example. You know, five years ago, um, six years ago, we had a conversation with two uh, Indigenous consulting partners. Um, they ran a small little boutique uh, organisation. And we had a conversation whereby um, we talked about could we, brand PwC, do something with this small indigenous consulting business. Now, were we or was I thinking shared value? No, I wasn't, right? I was thinking, okay, well, this could be incredibly impactful to the indigenous communities at large. It could bring real purpose to our amazing people that get out of bed every morning and want to do more and more good stuff. And if we do all that right, then there's obviously got to be a premium for brand PwC in the firm. Now, what then transcended was we formed a, a, a business which was 51% owned by the PwC Indigenous Consulting people, partners, and 49% owned by PwC Australia. Now, I took that to my global board and they said, Luke, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Right? We don't do um, minority ownership. We must control. And I said, no, what we're going to do, we're going to try this because I think it's really important that the Indigenous partners, the Indigenous consultants, they have control. And we're going to support and we're going to encourage and we're going to put a machinery there. But this is, this is what we're talking about as far as shared value. 
And guess what? Five, six years later, we're, we've, we've got a team of like 50, 60, 70 Indigenous consultants working hand in glove with our people. Our people at PwC want to go and get involved in those projects, may have, have an impact. And of course, it's, it's helpful to the firm and to the financial results of the firm. But, but yeah. did I go into that kind of thinking, shared value, shared value? No, I think it, leaders trying to figure out what the right balance. Okay, I'm going to, go to, I'm going to ask um, those of you in the audience, if you have questions, we'll come to you in one minute, just buttoning this up, and then I want to yeah. come to you, Daniel. But it, it's, I mean, Michael Porter talked about the fact that there's a bunch of different labels, and if we're not careful, it can get lost in labels, but labels actually matter. There needs to be, there needs to be a way to know it, count it, value it. So does shared, what is the value of shared value? You're here today, so what's the shared value advantage or value to PwC? Why does it matter? Because otherwise you wouldn't be here. Well, I think, it's, I think it matters. First and, first and foremost, it's, it's got to line up to your purpose. Now, our purpose is to build trust in society and solve important problems. We see the gap in trust and we believe leading brands must put their shoulders to the wheel to help in big societal issues. That's a responsibility that comes with leaders and leadership brands. And so you sort of just take that, take that down and basically shared value is, is how do you try and get purposeful work for your people, okay, tick? How do you have an impact on society and the communities that, that you're involved in, tick? And then the final piece is how do you, how do you financially get rewarded for that? And what I've found is that most organisations, um, they're either all about profit or they're kind of all about giving, but they haven't found that right balance between helping in a meaningful way, getting employees to, to care and to, to make a difference, and then financially benefiting from a return in that. And, and that's what shared value is for, for PwC. And we are oversubscribed on ideas and thoughts and issues from MS to homelessness to smart cities to, you know, and we ask our people, so we go out to our people, 8,000 people, where in society should we step up and be counted? And then we start to figure out, okay, how do we try and put shared value around this? Because it is not just about giving. It's got to be about how do you find that holistic balance in the context of shared value. All right, Anne, and then I'm coming to you. Too. Yeah, so I'd say, actually, you can measure it. And okay, like all business, you you've got to measure it. measuring is good. <laughs> so for me, uh, 60, we opened 60 new ports in 10 years, which we needed to do to grow the business. The business has grown from 200,000 Australians cruising a year to 1.8 million a year. So we can measure the business growth, and it couldn't have happened without the new destination, so that's one. The second thing we measure, and we do this jointly with the World Bank, is we measure our economic contribution everywhere we go. So we actually can say to the government of Vanuatu, the government of Solomon Islands, the government of PNG, this is the contribution that came from having your communities opening their doors to this particular form of travel. And Intrepid, I know, uh, does a lot of that as well. And we can also measure it through the job creation that we can. So we've got some very hard measures, as well as having top decile employee engagement. You know, there's a, but from a business, this was core to our business strategy. So we measured it by measuring the core components of our business strategy. And Daniel, how yeah. important yeah. is that from an entrepreneur with the with the kinds of companies that you're supporting and the investment dollars mm -hmm. that you're trying to raise yeah. and indeed are raising? How yeah. crucial is this? It's critical. And and I want to make one one comment to um, to the conversation earlier. Then I promise I'll answer that. Yeah, go but for it. I think I think. Um, when CSR came out, we used to look at that language and say, ah, corporate social responsibility, that sounds horrible. Uh, it should be uh, corporate social opportunity, which in essence is shared value. And just a good example of that are actually my shoes. And I apologize for my socks. My girlfriend was like, you can't wear those socks today. And I was like, they're the only ones I brought. But um, these shoes, are these are Cole Haan shoes. Uh, Cole Haan is owned by Nike. I, most people don't know this about Nike. They had a chief sustainability officer, Hannah Jones. She's one of our mentors. Um, she's now a chief innovation officer at Nike um, because those two things intersected perfectly and they didn't separate them. But um, fly knit shoes, if anybody has them with Nike, uh, really lightweight shoes. Um, what most people don't know is they're lighter weight, they're higher performing, um, but they're, um, the reason they're lighter weight is they're made from one thread. 
mm. which means there's 88% less waste in the production of this shoe. So you get a better shoe, you get less waste, which means you save more money, they charge more because it's a better shoe. How did they get that technology? They got it from an entrepreneur. Uh, and so we actually don't think entrepreneurs are the only uh, answer yeah. uh, to the problem. We actually think we need to get these entrepreneurs who are a beacon of where technology can take us around sustainability and then have them productively work yeah. with the world's largest institutions. So you uh, see the intersection oh, between... Oh, completely. And, and it's opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. We, we can't stand the word responsibility in that sense because uh, when you find that perfect intersection, everything flourishes. It's a win, win, win. Um, yeah, in terms of measurement, um, to answer your question, uh, it's, it's wildly important and it's really hard. Um, I was talking about this earlier with the breakfast panel. I think that what we measure is an indicator of what we value, mm -hmm. and what we measure changes behavior over time. So whatever it is that the core of your business values, measure it. I, even though you may not get it right, just measure it because it does show what you value and, I, and it does change behavior. Um, you know, all, all of our companies, uh, you know, we look at job creation, we look at uh, CO2 emissions and reduction, we look at uh, upcycling, recycling of waste, all those things. But what we ask is every entrepreneur selects one specific impact metric that is most adjacent to their profit model and the impact that they want to see in the world. Uh, we, we do have a fund, uh, and with our fund, actually, the carried interest, so the profits that we generate from investments, um, half of our carried interest is tied to the impact performance of the portfolio, which, is, which I think is really important because you, we can give a lot of lip service uh, to, to impact and to purpose, but uh, if we don't align the financial incentives of our team towards delivering on that, then it will always be uh, you know, competitive with each other. And so, so a couple thoughts, but measurement's yeah. hard and important. Hard and important. Let's open it up to the audience. Who's got a question? Raise your hand. I'm sure somebody does. Here, here. If not, I've got one here on the screen. Shareholders still seem to be such a key enabler or disabler for business to deliver on social purpose and social outcomes. What is the single most effective way to educate conventional shareholders that are only focused on profit ROI and influence them to be brave? Who's got a good tip on how to influence these uh, people who don't get it? Well, maybe I should start yeah. on that, given that um, bank shareholders have felt <laughs> aggrieved. Um, because, uh, and in fact, of course, what the Royal Commission has shown them is the value of doing more than just delivering your financial outcomes. Uh, and so in some ways now, there's as much questioning of directors about what are we doing for customers, what's the product cycle, where are you, where's your next uh, growth, where's your growth coming from? A lot of which fits into a broader conversation than just to deliver your financials year on year. So already there's been a shift. There are big global shareholders as well are influencing those conversations about we need to be more sustainable. I mean, anyone who's investing in uh, resources at the moment would be thinking, do I, don't I, how much more, how much less, should I hedge my bets? So I do think there's a broader conversation happening about uh, what's happening in markets, uh, not necessarily through a shared value lens, but what's the impact of uh, renewable energy on my particular stock? What's the impact of um, indigenous communities on mining companies? What's the impact of their environmental management on where their share price is going to be? So I do think that shareholders have in fact been more sophisticated. Um, domestic shareholders focused on returns are a harder group, but the reality is most big companies have big investors who drive a lot of the investor behaviour across their businesses, and they are talking more broadly than they were even five years ago. Luke? Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's right. A couple of words for me uh, spring to mind, and really just building off what Anne's what Anne said. Um, the first one is uh, leadership, um, and I think the role of a chair and a CEO is is changing in the context of leadership, shareholder engagement stakeholder engagement, sort of purpose and values leader of a, of a brand. Um, I think the sophistication now and the expectations are, are significantly sort of, sort of moving because the, the, the country and the world is kind of waking up that, 
that there's somewhat of a balance here between sustainability and purpose versus just in quarter or in year in your profit. Um, so the first one is, is, is leadership. The second one, to, to join a dot, it is courage, right? Which kind of goes with leadership. I do find it pretty hard to really express leadership in a fulsome, meaningful, purposeful way if you're not courageous. And so um, you, you need to have the support and you need to be willing to, to, to push back and to debate and to challenge with stakeholders and shareholders and know that you've got your board and you've got everybody lined up such that you're not the person sort of hanging out there that at the end of Q2's results are gonna get, are gonna get shot. And so how, how do you courageously sort of, sort of do that I think is, is really, really uh, important. And the third one, because it is so hard, so there's some empathy here to CEOs to just call it out. It's very easy, again in Australia, to stand one step back and to sort of throw everything at those CEOs or boards and say, oh, well, they don't care and they don't, you know, this and they don't do that and, and they're too conservative. Very easy to throw. Um, this is really, really hard and it's not a homogenous answer in, in my perspective. Um, it's about leadership, it's about engagement, and it's about figuring out in one year it may mean a little bit more on the purposeful side, in another year it might be more on the, on the profit side. It's, you're, you're going to be moving along that continuum um, based on your strategy and based on your engagement and your understanding and your clarity with not just the shareholders, the stakeholders more, more broadly. And so comms, and the art of comms, I think, is going to become more and more and more important. Not spin, not marketing BS, genuine, authentic, grounded, real comms is, is going to become super critical on the, on the go forward. Daniel, I see you nodding at this. What are your thoughts? I'm just agreeing with Luke on that one um, in, a, in, a, in a big way I, that I am um, marketing as a kind of sponsorship, the, the, the word we use is it feels like astroturf. So like the comms have to be just deeply authentic or else the world world's going to see that. Um, and, and I think completely uh, kind of spin away with it. But so long as it's authentic, um, then, then it really resonates. I, you know, the, I mean, the question around shareholders, um, we have, a, and I'm also just, I was just agreeing with the empathy for CEOs. So a number of our entrepreneurs have taken their companies public and like, wow. Uh, that is a different experience mm -hmm. I, uh, because I, our entrepreneurs typically have a very long-term view. They care about value creation, and value creation doesn't happen on a quarterly basis, and they're so far out of the you know, front lines in front of people. I'm trying to solve problems that haven't been solved before. That just takes time, I, and so I think it's very hard I, to be a CEO of a public company I, and to really try to have a long-term view with all the pressure that you have. It doesn't mean we can't do it, but it takes courage. I, and you have to be authentic in that communication and say, we're not going to do that, and here's why. But that's hard to do. Daniel, mm -hmm. I want to ask you this question first and then open it up to our other two panelists. But how can not-for-profits influence business leaders to work together towards a shared value focus? Because you're seeing some of this in terms of the companies that come to you. So how, do, how does a not-for-profit reach out to either an entrepreneur yeah. or for you guys to an yeah. existing company? To, yep. to change things and to get stuff done. I mean, you're, yep. you're in essence leading from the entrepreneur, the person with the idea. How does somebody who's over here in the space of, I see the problem, I'm not an entrepreneur, but I see the problem that needs mm -hmm. to be fixed. How do they get married to the entrepreneur who can fix it? Yeah, I think, I think part of it is uh, um, just reach out. And I, I know that sounds a little bit silly, uh, but it remi reminds me of a story. So, so one, one, one of our mentors, uh, uh, his name is Jeff Hoffman. He had co-founded Expedia Ubit Priceline. Um, in his first company, um, he had a really big exit, and uh, he tells a story. He said he was watching the news, right? I, and if you watch the news, you report the news. Uh, but if you're watching the news, um, it, he was saying he's watching headline after headline after headline, uh, and it was just negative, 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 depressing, depressing, anxiety producing, anxiety producing. <laughs> and he was watching the news, and he goes, you know, I wish. I wish they would do something about this. Like, why aren't they doing anything about this? And then all of a sudden he sat back and he realized there's no such thing as they, 
right? Mm-hmm. There, there, there's only us, so I need to do something about it. And, and to me, that's, that's really motivating um, because I, I, I think if you're a nonprofit or if you're any leader, if you're a business leader or a government or policymaker and you want to get involved, I mean, especially with entrepreneurs, especially the ones that we work with, all they care about is solving the problem. So if you reach out, like, it's pathologically collaborative. You know, we want to play together productively to try to move the needle on these challenges. Um, so it's just about reaching out instead of sitting back in that way. Can I give you an example, actually, because yeah. I chair UNICEF. Yeah. Um, first thing I'd say, though, is that one of the challenges for uh, not-for-profits working with particularly bigger for-profits, but even entrepreneurs, is that we speak completely different language. Very true. So yeah. there's something about getting out of, you know, all of us create language silos. Yeah. So we think we're saying the same thing and we make completely different things. So yeah. that's step one. Yeah. But at UNICEF, we've... To, we've got a million intractable problems yeah. and two in this region that we literally put out tenders saying who can help. One, uh, one was the delivery of vaccines to the outer islands in Vanuatu where kids don't even get triple antigen and yeah. die from stuff that you know our kids don't die from anymore. Um, except in a couple of parts of Australia, but we won't go there. Uh, the, uh, um, and so we said we need a solution to delivery, because until now it's been two weeks, backpacks, canoes, walking, canoes, walking, canoes, walking. And by the time the vaccine's delivered, it's useless. And a drone developer in Melbourne uh, has come up with the idea of delivery using drones. And that's in trial at the moment. And if that works, then the most remote places in the world we will be able to get vaccine delivery. The, you know, the foothills of the Himalayas, the parts of Afghanistan we can't get people into, all sorts of places we'll, we'll, we'll be able to deliver life-saving vaccines to children and adults. But that literally, we put it out yeah. there. Will you um, also be able to convince people to take them? No, no, there yeah. they all want them. No, I mean, it's I'm talking developed. first world. It's actually oh, in yeah, developed yeah. countries that people don't <laughs> think is. you need yes, vaccines. Exactly. In the developing countries, nobody what? thinks you don't need to Absolutely. vaccinate your children. Absolutely, no, there's a big disconnect. Um, but the second one is in Papua New Guinea, which is, again, an ont- uh, the problem was uh, uh, babies dying in their first 90 days. And the babies die of exposure. Why? Because during the day it's really hot and often at night it's freezing. And parents don't wrap their kids up because they didn't realise they were getting cold. And nobody actually knew why some of those kids were dying uh, until it was identified. And uh, again, an entrepreneur has come up with a tiny little device that costs a dollar to produce that you put on the wrists of your newborn babies and it beeps when their body temperature goes down. So it reminds everyone that the baby actually isn't doing so well now at 16, not 36 Celsius and they wrap them up and they keep them alive. And so that also has the ability to be rolled out globally. Mm-hmm. And it, and the more we roll it out, of course, the cheaper it gets. But those sorts of things are about entrepreneurs coming together with not-for-profits and solving problems that we've taken for granted mm-hmm. would never be solved. Can, yes, go yeah. for it, but I want to ask one final question. Just a comment on that. What, what that takes, though, is uh, resounding humility. Yeah. Right? To say, we don't have that, the answer. That, that, yeah. That's yeah. what it takes to actually collaborate. So would you say that's part of leadership too? Knowing when to be humble and say, don't know how to do it? I think almost, almost always be humble. Like, I think yeah. it's a paradoxical yeah. mix of confidence and humility. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Enough confidence to say we need to solve this problem. Like yeah. We're going to put it out there, but enough yeah. humility to say we can't do it alone. And right. I, I think that that's, that's collaboration. All right, yeah. last question. What advice do you have for the next generation of leaders to create a better world? Anybody? <laughs> oh, well, I'm happy. <laughs> Everyone's pointing at me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll follow you. Yeah. Uh, look, I would say um, be bold. Yeah. Firstly, be bold. Be impatient. You, don't, you shouldn't wait until you're older. I mean, I get more and more impatient the older I get. But don't wait until you're older to be impatient. Be impatient now because stuff takes time. And the third thing is collaborate. Yeah. All of us don't have the ideas, whether in corporates or not-for-profits or entrepreneurs, Everyone doesn't have the single big idea, but together, lots of things get mashed up and amazing ideas come out, whether that's from science and airlines or whether it's you know, drone developers and not-for-profits like UNICEF, whoever it is, you come together and you create much better outcomes than you do by yourself. Luke? Uh, courage, which we've talked about, yep. slash boldness. I think there's something here on adaptability. Mm-hmm. Uh, slash fungibility, leaders, leaders of today and even more in the future, all of our research shows that you need to be able to hit a forehand, a backhand, a volley, a smash. You need to have different attributes 
depending on, on, on what is happening sort of globally. And so on this profit for purpose, kind of a nuance or an adaptability of, of leadership and, and how we build leaders of tomorrow on those sorts of things, I think is going to be uh, really important. And probably the third one is, um, and it's hard to teach, it's hard to teach because you kind of live it through experience, but diversity of um, experience, diversity of understanding, diversity of perspectives. And if, if you maybe don't have it, an openness to put those that do kind of around you such that it's not just a, a one-dimensional sort of perspective on, on, on life and, and the universe. And mm. so building leaders that are broader, deeper, had ups and downs, had different experience personally, professionally, I think is is going to become more and more critical. I can and do it definitely. in 10 seconds. Yes, you, yeah. you, you can have more. I want to have your answer on I saw the wrap-up sign. Yeah. No, I'll give you a little more time because I'm, we want your answer yeah, on this. Yeah. I'm, so the question is advice for the next generation of leadership trying to create a better world. Uh, my, my perspective, not, not advice, but would be that you can't learn how to ride a bike by talking about it or reading about it. Mm. Right? You gotta get on the damn thing, pedal and fall over. I.e., if you wanna create a better world, go out, fail, fail. Like fail fast is the only way that you're gonna learn how to actually succeed is through your failures. And, and for me, I would, I would decrease the pressure you put on yourself though, right? Like my, my definition of failure is failure is only failure if you don't start, if you stop, or if you do something against your ethical fiber. Like everything else is just stumbling on your bike as you're trying to learn how to ride it. So just, just ride the bike, just do it. I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Luke Sayers and Sherry Daniel Epstein.